So when I was 11 months old, my mother died, and this aunt, Lucille, took me and a sister, and she began to raise us. Uh, we were in Savannah, Georgia. We lived normal lives as young kids. I really didn't know much about integration, racial problems, except on one occasion. And that would be when we would have periodic visits from the Ku Klux Klan. We lived in a shack. Thank you. 
church and spoke to the priest. The priest said, not here. Mm -hmm. No way. This housing project was at the end of, uh, of a long street in Philadelphia called Broad Street. And it was totally surrounded by white residents. So we couldn't go to school. And I couldn't believe it. 
give you a hand to lift you up. Uh, in my particular case, uh, the first one who helped me was the former Assistant Secretary for Consular Affairs, Mary Bryan. She was my mentor uh, and just the, the most marvelous person I have ever met. Now, um, I, I'll give you an example of how you can be helped and how you can help others. Uh, in 1974, we went to Doha, Qatar. Uh, I was sent there to set up the embassy administratively for the first American ambassador, who at that time was a fellow by the name of Robert Paganelli. Now, Bob Paganelli was a very um, man of, 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 of exceeding standards, shall we say. He was really a tough cookie, uh, but a man of impeccable uh, integrity and uh, absolutely determined to do what he wanted to do. After we had been at post for about six months or so, uh, he came to me and he said, Johnny, he says, uh, I want you to be in charge of the embassy when I go away. And I said, well, Mr. Ambassador, I said, that's very nice of you. But I said, uh, you know, uh, I'm an admin officer, uh, and administrative officers don't serve as charge aid. And I didn't want to add, I'm certainly not black on so he said, no, I want you to do it. I said, well, you have your political officer here, Brian Proper, who achieved the highest I did. And he said, that's OK. I want you to do it. I, the, 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 my, my former Bob Park Service colleagues over here are laughing because they know Brian Proper is truly a giant in the Foreign Service. That's a real giant, not me. Um, so I said, well, you have Brian here. I was Brian's boss at that time. And I said, you have officer and I said not me he says no I want you to do it so I said okay but I'm not going to fight the battle with the department as to who can be in charge of the mission he said I won't use the exact words that he said because it would be nice in his company um, but he says this is my embassy blank 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 and I'll do what the blank 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 I want to <laughs> and he did that during, uh, you know, his absences during our three years together. And that was an extremely important assignment for me uh, because it demonstrated that I could do other things as well. It, I had that established on my record and that it did serve me uh, very well. Um, I remember the time when I had, uh, when I was in Sierra Leone, I was, I'm sorry, I was in Togo, but there was a young man who um, I didn't know at all interested in being my uh, deputy chief of mission. He didn't have the grade of the job, but I had met him. I liked him. I thought he had great prospects. Uh, and, um, and, and I had come out of, of, of uh, HR at that time. And uh, they said, no, you have to select someone who, who has the grade for this job. And they said, Johnny, you know better. You can't select this man because he doesn't have the grade. And I said, He's the one I want. And we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and I did not budge uh, in my determination to have this man be my deputy. And uh, I won in the end. He became my deputy, and he's now serving his third ambassadorship. Um, so we do need people to help us and to support us, uh, and we do need to bring uh, people along. Now, uh, this, this emphasis that I have on people really began in my first assignment in Madagascar. With our deputy chief of mission at that time, a fellow by the name of Peter Walker. And what had happened was, Angie and I had talked about possibly leaving the Foreign Service and going back to university uh, so she could continue her studies. And uh, we then gave another thought towards the end of our assignment and we decided, well, we'll stay in. So we went to Peter Walker and we said, Peter, we've come to a decision we're going to stay in the Foreign Service. He says, well, you know, Johnny, all of the onward assignments have been taken. He says, there's nothing left for you. He says, but I'll write to a friend and see uh, what we may be able to do. So he wrote to this friend and the friend came back 
and said, the only thing that we have open that might work is um, an assignment as general services officer in Conan Creek, Guinea. Well, that was one of the true health holes of the world. <laughs> Yeah. 
Um, and you know, Americans are activists. We have to do something. And uh, my advice to the State Department was do nothing. Just leave it. And I was getting messages, oh Johnny, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta put them in the right direction. I said, just stay away from it. Let them make this decision. Uh, and uh, if they do, then that will be the right way to go. So I sent them a message, and uh, if, if I said, it's, it's like the Duke Ellington song, do nothing until you hear from me. Uh, and, and that's what they did. The Slovenes voted three to one to join NATO, and it all turned out uh, very well. Now, there are times uh, when um, you have uh, decisions that you have to make that, uh, well, rather I should say they're setbacks. Uh, I'm really happy to see uh, my former public affairs officer here from uh, Slovenia because I had a setback there in my initial assignment to Slovenia, and I didn't let it In my confirmation hearing, I mentioned several items that I wanted to achieve while in Slovenia. And this was at a time when Slovenia had already made its uh, application to join NATO and submitted it what is called an application plan. And so this was their commitment on paper that they were going to do all of these things in order to be favorably considered to join NATO. But my Comments at my confirmation hearing were taken out of context, and the Slovenes, or at least the Slovene press, uh, was under the impression that I was not going to be supportive and that I was going to work to undermine uh, their invitation. And shortly after I arrived, the Slovene press was waiting for me. First of all, we were a curiosity in the country to begin with. You can imagine black man, black woman, uh, in a country that's 99.9% .9 white. Uh, so we were a novelty, and everybody, every, everyone was curious to see who we are and what we were and how many heads we had, and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, anyhow, the number one paper in the country came out with an editorial that said, who does this colored gentleman think he is coming here telling us what to do? We're no banana republic. So I was curious, as you can well imagine. My, the first interview my wife had with one of the major uh, newspapers there, or, or magazines for ladies, first question he, uh, the reporter asked her was, how do you feel knowing that your husband is the most hated man in the country? Uh, she took care of it beautifully. Uh, and uh, I got the public affairs officer together with other members of uh, the country team, and I said, give an interview to, uh, I'm prepared to talk to everyone in the media. I don't care who it is, I want to talk to them. Uh, and I, I did, and I started out every interview, every discussion with race cannot be on the table if I'm going to have a relationship with this country. I think it took about two weeks. It was over. It never again in our time in Slovenia, and uh, by the time I was ready to leave three years later, I think I could have been elected the mayor of the capital city. Uh, and it, it, all, it all turned out uh, very well. Um, now, uh, sometimes, you know, when you're negotiating also, I wanted to mention that you reach uh, difficulties, and uh, you can't let them hold you back. You have to keep forging ahead. When we were in the Netherlands, we were trying to work out a bilateral agreement uh, with the Dutch uh, so that the uh, dependence of our respective di diplomats would work in our respective countries. And you would think this would be a rather simple, routine matter. Uh, but the Dutch are wonderful people, and I love them. But they can be as stubborn as mules. Uh, they just will not budge. Uh, and they would not budge on this issue of Immunity. And I remember our ambassador at the time was Jerry Burner. And Jerry Burner and I would go to the foreign ministry and we just go over this over and over and over again. And the Dutch wouldn't.
much. Uh, anyhow, we finally found a little opening, and uh, we told them, well, if, if, if uh, one of our diplomats should be, or the, 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 you know, a family member of one of our diplomats is working in one of your banks or whatever the case may be, and should steal all of the money, uh, we would entertain a request uh, for waiver of immunity. Mind you, the Dutch never put that in terms of a Dutch person in the United States, the implication would be they were considerably of higher moral But anyhow, it, it worked out. Uh, in Bahrain, when we were negotiating for additional land for the naval base, uh, the Bahrain government didn't want to hear about the parcel of the land that we wanted because they had their master plan already made. Uh, and um, they uh, they they wouldn't, they didn't want to disturb that. Once again, back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. In the end, we finally came to agreement, and it all turned out very well, and we were able to triple the space of the American base for the fifth fleet uh, in Bahrain. So, uh, in so many of these uh, negotiating uh, situations, you just have to keep plugging away. You have to, in many cases, work quietly in Bahrain, before I got there, the Bahrainis had requested uh, some very sophisticated uh, missiles, two types. I was told before I went out there, Johnny, don't even think about it. It'll never happen in your lifetime. They're not going to get it. Uh, anyhow, through quiet, persistent diplomacy, uh, they got both missiles, uh, both types of missiles, and it worked out very well. You know, I could go on and on and on with but I think I'm going to stop there. I just wanted to mention what happened after I left the Foreign Service. After I left the Foreign Service, I worked for a couple of years um, privately. I did some work with the State Department. I did some work for a company in Liechtenstein. Uh, and then in 2007, my wife and I were both at home. She had not yet started to work, and she was trying to push me out of the house. Get her. And I told her, well, if I ever go back to work, it would have to be to do something for good. So um, we were reading the paper one Sunday, and um, I saw an ad for Executive Director of Migration and Refugee Services, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. And I said to Angie, I said, now this is the kind of job that I would like. She said, apply, apply. So, I said, I don't think they want me. I think this is probably an inside job because very often companies will uh, advertise for positions, but they really have someone in mind internally. So anyhow, I sent in my resume with a one sentence cover note, please find me in close or attach my resume for such a position. Now, if you're serious about getting a job, you're certainly not going to get it with one, uh, one, one line of sentence. You have to do a real serious couple of So then months, you know, about a month and a half later, we went to the gala of an organization we belong to called the Washington Institute of Foreign Affairs. And uh, at that gala, one of my former foreign service colleagues, who saw Angie, he says, Angie, 
And the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has partnered with the government in admitting or in processing one million of the three million. So it's that much. When I left in February, we had a budget of $85 million and a staff of over 105 uh, employees. It was great work in addition to resettling refugees. Uh, we did work in anti-trafficking. Uh, we provided services to unaccompanied minor children. All those kids who were coming in uh, to the U.S. from Central America last year, uh, we partnered with the federal government in processing uh, those kids. So that was my second call to service. Uh, I'm now working on my third call to service. Uh, I hope to be a teacher of English to speakers of other languages. I'm completing my coursework now. I'm following in the footsteps of Ambassador Ken Brown. And that's what I hope to do. I hope to do it voluntarily. Uh, one of the things that I was able to see firsthand when I was uh, Executive Director of Migration and Refugee Services was to see these refugees all over the United States and who were struggling to fully integrate uh, into America because they had very limited English. So any contribution that I can make uh, to those people that I will teach in the future, uh, I'm looking forward to it. So with that, I will say, my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs>
factors that will uh, that you'll be looked at very carefully as they evaluate you in terms of you know your creativity and your resourcefulness and how well you can write and on and on. So that's what I would suggest. Hi, I'm Lynn Lee. I'm a
mean, that's my own personal view. I think that we should be doing a whole lot more. And I, I know we're scared. Uh, we, we have fears of security concerns that may come back to bite us uh, later on. But how can we, um, we have always been the moral leader uh, in this area.
me at my church, my Catholic church, just recently, about four months ago, um, I was alone on that particular Sunday. I, was, I got into the pew and I went to the middle. And there were people coming in from the other sides. And this lady came in with her husband and she put her purse there. And she wasn't aware that I was in the middle. She turned around, she looked at me, and she grabbed the purse and pulled to herself like that. Now, I don't know if she was aware of how I sensed that situation, but I sensed it. And that happens in subtle ways like that. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, I, I still think there's a lot of work to be done. A lot. It's subtler, but it's definitely No.
I can't tell you how many embassies I have been in where I was the only one, including in particular, I should say, after I became ambassador. Uh, it, it was just, <laughs> I used to joke, uh, uh, you know, with my wife, when I was, when I was in Slovenia, I was the only black ambassador in all of Europe, and they would have the chief of missions conference, and I would say, edgy my God, I'm the only fly in this bowl of milk. It's fine. 
Um, some of that's highly effective because a lot of what diplomats do is try to get foreign governments, please walk with us, please agree with us, please join us, please do our biddings, please serve, would you do that? Sometimes stepping at, back and saying, yeah, I can do that with you, it's not so hard for a woman It's not so hard. So I think that for all the reasons why it's difficult, because like Shine, many times I've been the only person of my gender in the room, and it's awkward, and, and people aren't used to what should they do about you. But for all of that, which is there, there's also a side that can bring something to this that is, I think, really, really uh, helpful in making common cause and communicating and connecting and getting people to come together and solve problems. So I think it, do not be discouraged, it is totally <laughs> Were any of you here when Ambassador Pickering spoke? No, well, then one of certainly one of the most distinguished diplomats of any any time. But when he joined the service, his uh, he married his wife, who was also a foreign service officer, and she had to quit. She quit. Uh, they were married in the Netherlands. Uh, I remember he came on a visit to the Netherlands when we were there, and we went back to the old building uh, where they were married, and you know, uh, he talked about the good memories and what have you. She had to quit, and I could name so many others who had women who had to quit. Uh, some of them were given an opportunity to come back into the service, and uh, many of them who uh, took advantage of that did very well. But it was in just think about it, in 1967, it was a different time in service. Very different. But uh, you, I, I, any woman who wants to go into the foreign service should do it, and believe me, you have a clear path to the top. Hi, sir. Hello, my name is Yanami. I'm from Germany.
that's what has really uh, motivated me and has helped me along the way. I never lost hope, and I think that is so important. Yeah.